All right, well, my name is Bryce, um, like Chris said, and uh, today I'm going to be going through the uh, algorithm section, um, at least a few of them in the free code camp curriculum. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a web developer currently at Land Traffic Control. Um, it's a, uh, we make like logistic software for the trucking industry. Um, we're out of Stillwater, Oklahoma. I've been building uh, web and network applications for about six years. I work primarily in Angular, Vue, and Node. Um, we do a little bit of .NET Core um, and some other stuff where I'm at though. Um, I used to work at the Oklahoma State University Foundation. Um, you guys can see me, you'll see me on Slack um, as PyGuy, um, and I got some links here to my GitHub, LinkedIn, Twitter, and all that. So. Um, we will go through a few of the beginner algorithms first. Um, the first one that I have here, I guess I'm gonna have to leave the full screen. Um, the first one we're gonna do is called reverse a string. Um, we're gonna write a function that um, takes a string in and spits out a reverse of that string. Um, you may need to turn the string into an array before you can reverse it and the result that comes back must be a string. So I've got a few solutions for this. Um, the first one is probably the most common. Um, it's really the most recommended because it's, it's easy to read um, and reason about. Basically, we create a function um, called reverse that accepts, as a, accepts um, a string as an input, splits that string into an array, calls the array's reverse method on it, and then joins it back together before returning it. So this one, um, like I said, this is the one that you're probably gonna see the most. Does anyone have any questions about kind of how this works, turning it into an array and turning it around? Cool. Um, so the next one is use, the solution uses a for loop. We start by um, creating an empty string that we're going to accumulate the characters in reverse on. We loop over every character in the string starting from the end. So we'll take the length of the string, um, subtract one from it, that'll give us the last character of the string, and we just move downward um, and capture each character of that string and add it to reversed. And then finally, once the loop is over, we just return that reversed string. Um, the other one, I think this one is a little bit better. Um, this uses a for of loop. I tend to prefer for of loops because it's a little bit more clear about what you're iterating over. Um, with a regular for loop, we just have this iterator i. Um, here we can, it's more clear what we're iterating over. Like for each character of the string that's been split, we concatenate uh, the current character to the front of the accumulator that we have here reversed. So we're not having to think about running a loop in reverse or anything like that, we're just taking each character and appending it to the front of the accumulator that we've created at the beginning. It's a little bit easier to think about. Um, also, I prefer using the template literals like this, it's just kind of easier for the, for the reader of the code to see what's going on with it. Um, before we move into another one, um, I created some tests for all of these solutions. So we can actually test all of these and make sure that they work. Can you guys read this terminal output? It's probably easier to do it here. Is that big enough? Okay, um, so here I guess it's probably easy if we look at the tests also. So here I've written a few tests. Um, the string JavaScript should spit out this. Um, and the same thing for Express, Postgres, Postman, GraphQL. Um, we've written tests for all of the functions that we're gonna go over today. 
Uh, there's also a branch, if you clone this repository, you can check out the practice branch and it will have all of these functions with no code inside of them. So if you wanted to go through and kind of fill them out yourself, you can run it pretty easily um, by just running the npm test command. Um, the repository, is here, I will post this to the Slack channel. Okay, um, so there's a link to the repository. If you wanna clone this and check out the practice branch and kind of fill any of these in yourself, you can run the tests and you can determine is my solution correct or not? Um, there are gonna be a few in here that we'll see where the tests aren't passing. It's so we can kind of illustrate um, a couple of different scenarios. Okay, so the next one that we're gonna do, uh, or does anyone have any questions on reversing a string? Yeah, so he wants to know um, with the for loop versus the split and reverse function, which one of those is gonna be faster. Um, the for loop should be faster. It should also be more memory efficient because we're not having to create a new array. Um, but for something as simple as reversing a string, typically performance isn't something that we're gonna care about. Um, I'm gonna be more cared about, can I read and understand this code? that's often going to be the deciding factor in what makes a piece of code good or not. Um, at least for me personally, if it's, not, if it's not like really important to have really good performance, um, it should be easier for another human to read. Um, I feel like code is for humans more than it is for computers. Um, it gets read a lot more than it gets written. So a readable solution and one that someone can comprehend quickly and easily, to, for me, oftentimes is a much better solution than one that's gonna be, you know, trying to get every ounce of performance out of it. That's a good question, though. Um, okay, so the next one, factorialize a number. We are going to return the factorial of a provided integer. Um, if the integer is represented with the letter n, a factorial is the product of all positive integers less than or equal to n. Factorials are often represented with the shorthand notation of n bang, or n exclamation mark. For example, five factorial is one times two times three times four times five, which equals 120. Only integers greater than or equal to zero will be supplied to the function. And this is just the uh, text out of the question from the curriculum on the website. Um, any, there's, they have some tests in there as well. You know, when you fill out your solutions, they'll run some tests. Uh, my test cases are a little bit different, um, but they should, they should all still be the, the same. Okay, so factorialize is here. Okay, so the first solution here uses a while loop. We initialize the factorial result to one, then we loop over um, while num is greater than one, set the factorial to the result of factorial times num, and then decrement num by one, then return the result. So here we're starting at the end. We're starting at the current number and decrementing it downwards until we get to one. And really, since we started off at one, we could really change this to two and it would be the same. But this, I think, is just easier to read and understand. Okay, so this one um, also uses a while loop, but it starts from the other end. So we initialize our counter to one, and we create a cur variable that we're gonna use to keep track of where we are currently in the loop. Um, so while, while the counter variable cur is less than the number that's provided, we're gonna set the factorial to the result of factorial times cur, and then increment cur by one. So here we're starting from the other end, um, we start at one and go upwards and we multiply every time the loop increments. Um, this one does have a little bit more to keep track of just with the addition of the cur variable. 
Um, some people, though, it's easier for them to think about a loop moving upwards. It's just kind of the more common way to do it. Personally, I prefer the first solution, but a lot of readers would also prefer this one. It's just kind of a matter of preference. There's not really much of a difference between either of them. Um, you're going to get the same result. Okay, so this can also be solved with reduce. Um, has anyone, have you guys used map, reduce, and filter before? Can show of hands if you've used these functions before? Just a few? Okay, um, I think maybe better to just skip reduce. It's kind of a difficult one to wrap your head around. Um, we don't need to go through and explain how reduce works. We'll, we will cover map and filter though. Um, reduce is just kind of a little tougher for beginners sometimes, um, but we'll, we'll look at map and filter and we'll definitely explain those. Um, does anyone have questions on factorializing a number? Which one? Which? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would never solve this problem with reduce. Um, I mean, I was just trying to come up with like, here's some different ways that you can solve these algorithms. Um, these first few, there's not a whole lot of different ways that someone would probably go and build them. Um, so this one I just threw in reduce just to show that you can. Um, but yeah, don't, this isn't the type of problem that you're typically going to want to solve with reduce. Okay. So the next one is confirm the ending. We're going to check if a string, the first argument to our function, ends with the given target string, um, which will be the second argument. Um, this challenge can be solved with the ends with method, which was introduced in ES 2015. But for the purpose of this challenge, we'd like you to use one of the JavaScript substring methods instead. Okay, um, so the first one that I came up with for this um, is a regular expression solution. Has anyone used regular expressions before? Yeah, okay. Um, regex is a lot of fun. Um, I love using regex for things like this because we know, especially for this question, we know it's gonna be at the end. Um, so really we can just use the, uh, the dollar sign character which represents the end of a string and then use the submitted target string stick it right in there before that, and then run the regular expression dot test method. Um, this is a really, really easy to read and understand solution to this problem. Um, that this would probably be the one that I would go with. Um, yeah. Um, so we can also use last index of. We're gonna find the last index of the substring within the string. If it doesn't exist, then obviously the string doesn't end with it, we can return false. If the length of the string minus the last index of the substring is equal to the substring length, then we'll return true. So basically we're just checking to make sure if this, if the submitted string is present and at the very end of the, of the target string that we're comparing against. So here, last index of, um, if it returns a negative one, that means that the string wasn't found. Um, there's also an index of, method on strings where you would call like this str.index of and then the substring that you want to check. It will always return the first index at which that string appears within the substring. So here we can use the last index of which guarantees that it's gonna, if it has several, if that string appears several times in the string, it's gonna give us the index of the last one. Um, that's the one we're interested in since we wanna make sure that it comes at the end of the string. Does anyone have questions on that one? That one's kind of different. Okay. Okay, um, so here we're gonna use a for loop based solution. Um, we're gonna compute an offset first so that we can correctly compare the position of characters of str and sub. We'll loop over the characters of the sub string, of the submitted string, the big string from right to left if the character at the current position of sub doesn't match the character at the same position from the right of str, then we're gonna return false. Otherwise, we'll return true. So here, we're gonna start at the very, very end of both str and sub. 
we're gonna, and the reason we have to compute an offset here is because the lengths of these two things might be different. So we need to know that if we're at the, at the rightmost character of sub, we need to also be at the rightmost character of str, and then we're gonna move them both to the left, from right to left, and check the string at the position of sub and the string at the position of str. If they're different, then we know that it doesn't end with sub, we can just return false. Um, otherwise, we're gonna just wait until the loop runs out. After we've looped over every character of sub, we know we can return true because the for loop didn't return false yet. Does that make sense? This one's kind of hard to wrap your head around. Um, it is the most efficient solution to this problem that I know of. Um, I haven't seen a better way to solve it, but would I probably write this solution? Probably not, because ends with is just the easiest way to do this. Um, we're not using ends with though because they they don't want us to in the solution in the or in the description of the question. Um, I did throw it in there though, because why not? I mean, this is this is how you would normally write this. Um, just use the ends with, and it will tell you whether or not a string ends with that substring or not. Um, any questions on confirm ending? Okay, uh, repeat a string, repeat a string. Here we are going to repeat a given string um, for n times and return an empty string if num is not a positive number. So this one's actually kind of fun. Um, there's a lot of different ways to solve this. You can get really clever with it. Um, you can do it on one line pretty easily with an array solution. I'm gonna skip over that one for now. Um, let's look at the ES6 solution. So this one's gonna use template literals and a for loop. Um, the first thing we're gonna do is check to see if n is less than or equal to zero. If it is, we'll just return empty string. Um, then we will create a new variable repeated that we're gonna use to store the repeated string in while we loop over n times and concatenate them together. Um, this solution is probably the most common that you'll see a beginner write. Um, all we're doing is we are looping for as many times as the user or as the caller of the function has provided and then we just concatenate these together using a template literal. Um, have you guys used template literals before? So basically what it is, and I, I should have mentioned earlier, that you can use these back ticks here, and then whatever you put inside of here is just gonna be interpreted as a string, unless you surround it by this dollar sign and then curly braces, and it will look in the current scope and see, does that name exist? If it does, it will inject it into that string. Um, it's really useful for debugging. Um, so say you have like, a, we can just get into a terminal here real quick. So say you have a date object, and this could be anything, I'll just use date because it's, it's nice. Um, so you could say today is date, and it will call the toString method of this date object and just inject it right into your string. So you don't have to do any like concatenation, it's just a little bit easier to work with um, objects that you want to put inside of a string. Um, and that's the template literal. You just use the back ticks rather than single or double quotes. Okay, um, so the while loop solution, I think I typically am gonna prefer over a for loop for this particular problem. Um, we're gonna first, just like all of the other solutions, check to see if n is less than or equal to zero. If it is, we just wanna return an empty string. Then we'll go and create a repeated variable that we'll use to accumulate our repetitions. Then create a while loop, and we're gonna loop while the length of repeated, this variable here, is less than um, the length of the string times n. So this one for me I think is easier to think about because it's it just reads more um, like a human would think. We're just saying while the length of the repeated string is less than the string length times n because we wanna repeat the string n times. 
um, and then we just add them together, concatenate them together. And then we return the result. This, okay, so this one here is a for loop. Um, it's just like the while loop where um, we're just looping in times and then concatenate, concatenating them together and then returning it. Um, does anyone have questions on string repetition? No? Okay. Okay, this one, boohoo. Um, we're gonna check if a value is classified as a Boolean, return true or false. Boolean primitives are true and false. So here we're gonna use the type of operator to determine is the thing passed into the function a Boolean? So here we just call type of bool, the provided argument, and check to make sure that it's equal to Boolean. Um, I should probably... I didn't think, so I used the, that Fura code font, um, and it's got the code ligatures, it's hard to tell like what it is that I've typed there. Um, Really code. It's called Fira code. Um, I really like it. It, ma it makes it really obvious like that this is an arrow function or this is a triple equals or a not equals, but if you haven't seen it before, it can look confusing. I don't know where it's at. Anyway, okay, so this is a triple equal sign though. Um, we're just checking to see if the result of the type of operator is equal to Boolean. Um, here, sometimes you'll see people write, write this like this. So these two functions are exactly the same. Because the triple equals operator here is going to return a Boolean, we don't need to check that Boolean and then if it's true, return true. If it's not true, return false. We really just need to return the Boolean. So that's exactly what we're doing here. We're just skipping this if else. Um, so you don't need to say like if true, return true, if else, return false. You can just return the condition. Does that make sense to everyone? Um, it, it just makes your code a little bit less verbose, um, easier to read, especially because we always know that this is going to be a Boolean. Okay, so in this example, we're gonna use the object prototype um, and the toString method to determine what type a thing is. Um, this solution is a bit overkill for figuring out if a thing is a Boolean or not, but sometimes it can be a lot more useful for figuring out other types of things. So when you do a type of on a date object, for instance, it's gonna tell you that that date is an object. It won't tell you that that date is a date object. So using the object prototype to string method will give us more information about what type of thing this is. Um, in this case, we're, we're still checking to see is this a Boolean or not, um, but using the, um, using the object prototype to string sometimes can be a lot more useful for us to figure out what a thing is. Um, in the third example here, I've just used, um, I've created a little type helper that will basically go in, call the object prototype.toString, and then run a regular expression against it to tell us, um, basically to hack off the object space name of thing and then the, the ending uh, square bracket. So this is just using another helper that I've written to get some of this code out of the way. Does anyone have questions on those? Okay. The, 
do I say that one more time? Sometimes. So he wants to know if I hurt a little bit inside um, when I write, um, when you have to write something long and complex like that. Oftentimes it doesn't, it doesn't start. I mean, this one, I've written this function many, many times, so I just have it memorized at this point. Um, but oftentimes it'll start a lot more spread out. And then as I just kind of look at the code, I'll think, oh, I can reduce this down a little bit here, or clean this up there. Um, this is an iterative process. It's not something that you just can all of a sudden one day just string all this stuff together. You know, it just kind of happens over time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, that is it. The, that is it for the beginner algorithms that I have in here. Um, we can go through some of the intermediate ones. Uh, before we do that though, I think this is where we start using map and filter quite a bit. Um, so it would be really helpful for you guys, I think, to go over those. The first one is gonna be sum all numbers in a range. Yes. Okay, so map is an array function that'll, that accepts as an argument another function. And what it's gonna do is for each item in that array, it's gonna call your function and then it's gonna take the result and push that into a new array. So these, I'm, when I was first learning, were kind of hard for me to wrap my head around. Um, and I think it helps to see what this function actually looks like. Oops. Let's type a plus there. So here um, we've called array.map and we've passed it a function that's gonna take each one of these letters in as an argument. And then from that function, we return the letter plus ZZ. So the result we end up with is A plus ZZ, B plus ZZ, C plus ZZ, and this gives us a new array. Um, a re the map, reduce, and filter methods on arrays are, in my opinion, like some of the most useful pieces of JavaScript. They're fantastic. Um, there's hardly any time I'm gonna be working with arrays that we don't use these methods. They're just really, really useful, especially when you have some piece of data that you need, like some array of things that you need to turn into something else or just change the data slightly. Um, these are really, really helpful methods for you to use. Yep. Because the, and Chris asked why you have to assign it to a new variable. So you're asking why we had to create this mapped variable. So array.map, array.filter, array.reduce, these all return new arrays. They don't actually mutate the existing arrays that they're working on. Um, so we have to capture that into a new variable so that we can do something with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So he was asking, um, could we also have made a made a new array and then looped over ARR with a for each and then just appended them in there ourselves? Yeah, we can absolutely do that.
So here we're doing the exact same thing, only we're using a for each loop to achieve the same result. I've, the, it's oftentimes just cleaner to use the mapped, the, to use the array dot map. It's, yeah, it, the map implementation is similar. Um, and we can do it really quickly here. Um, let's see, so map is gonna take, a, and we'll call it callback, and make it a little easier. So map works off of the array prototype, um, but here we'll have ours accept an array as an argument so that we're not overriding the map, um, the native map function. So what we're gonna do is we create a, a new array. We'll call it return array. So this is really similar to the native map impl implementation. Oops. I'll just split this out a little bit so it's easier. So here, this map function accepts as an argument um, the first item is going to be the array that you're wanting to map, and then a callback function, which is gonna get called for each item that's in that loop. And then the result of that callback call is what's gonna get pushed into this new return array and then returned at the end. Um, and we can use this here really quickly. Let's see, array. So here we get the exact same result. Cool, those are good questions. Um, does anyone else have any questions about map in general? Um, super useful function. Nope, okay. Um, so before we move back into the intermediate algorithms, let's look at filter really quickly. Um, so filter is gonna be a function that um, it also works off of an array, and you return a condition for each item in that array. If that condition is true, the item is kept in the new array. If it's false, it's excluded. So here, and let's, let's do this. So here I've defined an array um, of different types of things, right? Um, we can create a new array from the original array and we'll call the filter method, which is going to accept a function and that function is going to accept an item. And let's check and see if it's a string, we wanna keep it. Otherwise, we wanna exclude it. So we can say if type of item is string, return true. Otherwise, return false. So here we've created a new array based off of our original array and we've excluded all of the items in there that aren't strings. Now here, this is fairly verbose. Um, remember earlier we can just return a condition rather than checking a condition and returning true or false. 
So we can say return type of item equals string, and that will give us the same result. We can reduce it down further by using an arrow function. and still just get the ones that are of type string. Any questions on filter? Filter is a little easier to wrap your head around than map is, um, but it's still really, really useful. You'll find yourself using it a lot when you have some array of items that you wanna do some work on. Okay. So, uh, moving into the intermediate algorithms, uh, the first one that we're gonna look at is some range. So this one is going to use a for of loop. Um, have you guys used for of or mostly just like a traditional for loop or a for each? Um, show of hands who's used for of. Just two, okay. Um, ev has everyone used for loops though? Just a regular for loop with a counting variable? Yeah, okay. So a for of loop works on items that are iterable. And it just makes it to where you can be, you don't have to keep track of the counting variable. Um, it's going to just iterate over an array of items. So say we have like one, one, two, three, four. If we wanted to use, ah. If we wanted to use a for of loop to loop over these things, we would just say for item, and th that can be anything you want. Um, for let num of my array. And here you can get access to num. So the first time this runs over, num would be one. The second time, two, three, and four. And then once it's run out of items, the for loop just exits and the code continues on. Um, for, loop, for of loops are great, except that you don't get access to the iterable, I don't think. So you don't know what the current index of it is. Sometimes you might want to know that. You might want to be able to do something else on that item other than just have access to it. You may want to know its position in the overall array. Um, if you don't need it though, for of loops are often a lot more cleaner and easier to follow than a traditional for loop with a counting variable that you're keeping track of and incrementing at the end of each loop. Okay. So our goal here is to take in a range of numbers. Um, they're gonna get passed in in an array with the first number being where we start and the second number being where we end. So here range is going to look something like this where it's gonna pass in a one and a five. We need to get all of the items in that range, one, two, three, four, and five, and then sum them all together. So to make this um, a little bit easier, I wrote a helper function called underscore range that I can just pass that to and get back the range of numbers. And it's here at the bottom. Um, we can read through it really quickly. So the range function here, um, it's going to take in a low and high number it's going to create a new array called range and check and see if this array is, or if the low and high numbers are reversed. So because it, I think the question, it doesn't tell us that the low number is necessarily always gonna come first. It may come at the end. All we know is we have a range of numbers and we need to figure out the sum of all the numbers in between, but we can't just start at the low number and go to high. If they're reversed, we need to figure that out first, right? So we're gonna check and see, um, is the array reversed by checking to see if the low number is actually higher than the high number. If it is reversed, um, we're gonna use destructuring here to swap those two variables. Um, show of hands who's used array destructuring? Just a couple. So typically when you need to swap two variables in a place or in, a, in um, you need to swap the values of two variables. You'll, you'll create a third variable that you can use to hold on to 
the original value of one of those so that you can swap them. Um, so normally that looks like this. No, we can just say let temp. And we can say low is equal to high. Temp is equal to high. No, temp is equal to low. There we go. So these three lines here are equivalent to the line above. Um, but with the line above, it just we just use destructuring here to swap those variables in place um, without really explaining destructuring. Basically, what we're doing is we're putting high and low into an array, and this syntax over here allows us to grab those items out of the array by position. Um, it's just a quicker and easier way of doing um, setting this temp variable in between and then swapping them out. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, um, so once we've figured out if the array has been reversed and we've got our high and low positions in the correct place, now all we have to do is um, create a while loop and we check and see while low is less than or equal to high, we push onto our range the low number and increment it. So if we start with one and five, the first thing we're gonna do is push a one onto our range variable up here. The plus plus operator is then going to increment that, so the next time the loop runs, low will be two. And then we'll push low onto the range. So now we have one and two. And that will keep going until low is less than or equal to high. And at that point, the loop is done. All we have to do then is check and see, um, was the array originally reversed? If it was, we're just gonna swap it back out. Um, we're just going to reverse the array and then return it. So this is just a helper function that's just going to create that range for us. Rather than in each one of the solutions, re-implementing this functionality of creating a range based off of two numbers, we're just gonna call our range helper function. Okay, so back to the first solution. Um, we are going to set our range of, in this case, say it's back to this one and five, we're going to create a new range based off of that, which is gonna give us one, two, three, four, and five, right? So we're gonna initialize a sum and then use our for of loop <clears throat> to go over each of those numbers and add to the running total here. So we'll start with one, we'll add one to zero, give us one, then the next time we'll add two, then three, then four, then five, and then return the result. Does anyone have questions about that one? Okay. Okay, we will skip the reduce solution. Um, so for this next solution, we're gonna also use a while loop, but we're not gonna use the range helper. Just so you can see what it looks like. Um, so the first thing we do here is we're gonna extract the start and end um, components of this range array that's getting passed to us. We're also gonna initialize a sum. We're gonna check and see if start is greater than end, then we're gonna swap those out like we did in the range helper. And then we're gonna loop over um, while start is less than or equal to end, and then add to the sum whatever start is currently, and then increment it. So this works just the same as the one above, it just doesn't use the range helper to get us there. Okay, so um, this solution is nice for several reasons. Um, it's gonna have the lowest memory use of all of the other solutions because it's not creating that range and storing it anywhere in memory. All it's gonna do is get the low number and the high number in the correct position 
and then loop for each number in between them until the low number is the high number and then it will stop. So here we're not storing any copy of a range anywhere in memory, we're just using, we're getting them in the correct position in order to loop over them. Okay, any questions about range? Or some summing numbers in a range, no? Okay, um, the next one is seek and destroy. You will be provided with an initial array, the first argument in the destroyer function, followed by one or more arguments. We're going to remove all elements from the initial array that are of the same value of these arguments. Note that you have to use the arguments object. Okay, um, so here we are going to convert the arguments object. Has everyone, has anyone used that, by the way? The arguments object? It's kind of a magical piece of JavaScript that just appears in all of your function contexts. Um, anytime you have a function, you have access to this thing called arguments here. Um, and it's weird because we didn't declare arguments. We didn't say what arguments was, we just have arguments. And this is a, it's an array-like object that contains all of the arguments that were passed into this function when it was called. So using that, we can, even though here we're only declaring that we're going to um, take in an array item, this function could have been called with 50 different items. Um, and the arguments object is what's going to allow us to get access to those other items that were passed into the function when it was called. So here, um, what we're gonna do is, using the, arguments using the arguments object, we're essentially just going to turn it into an array. Um, that's what this array.slice.call does. And then here we're going to slice off the very first item um, so that we don't also capture the original array that we're supposed to be iterating over. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. So, let's just take that out. Just make this a little more readable. Okay. Okay, so here, um, once we've got an array of arguments that were passed in, we loop over the array that was passed and we're gonna filter out any items that aren't present in the args object. Um, so for example, Let's look at the test, because this one's kind of hard to see what it's doing without the tests. <clears throat> so for this first example, we're gonna pass in one, two, three, and we want to remove any items in there that aren't three. And we're expecting it to return a function, or to return an array of just one and two. Does that make sense, what this function should be doing? So I'm gonna give it an array of items, and then some more items that I want to be removed from that array. In this case, it's just three. If we pass it one, two, three, and then two and three, we should just get back an array of one. Okay. Okay, um, so ES6 makes this solution a lot easier. Um, in ES6, they introduced the array.from method, which here, in order to get the arguments object to look like an array, we had to use this weird array.slice.call syntax in order to turn it into an array. Um, but because it's array-like, it has like, say there's like five items in the arguments, it can turn that into an actual array of five items. So we can use that to our advantage here to call array.from and then just remove the first item out of it, which is the actual array that we're wanting to remove items from 
and then call the exact same filter method. This is just a lot cleaner. Um, it's, yeah, it's just a lot more readable when we can use this array.from syntax. Um, a lot more people can kind of understand what it is that that's doing um, rather than the first solution. And then we can skip the one-liner. Are we about out of time, Chris? Yeah, okay. All right, um, well that's all I think we're gonna have time to get through today. I think I've went over three or four minutes. Um, but does anyone have any questions about any of these or just kind of JavaScript algorithms in particular? Did anyone try these before they came in today? No? Um, so if you want to try these, um, you can clone this repository and try and re-implement some of these solutions yourself. Um, you can check out the practice branch and you'll see that I've gone in, oops. So in the practice branch, I have removed all of the solutions. Um, I just have the functions in here. Um, so you can go in and fill in your own solutions if you want, and then if you want to test those solutions, you can run the NPM run test. Um, these will all fail because there are no solutions in there anymore because I removed them. Um, but that way you can tell and see, you can see if your solutions are passing the tests or not. 